Hi everyone, today we're going to be solving AQA, GCSE Chemistry, Higher Tier, Paper 2. Today we're solving June 2020, Part 1. In this particular question paper, we're going to be solving for question number 1 to question number 5. This question is about chemical analysis. A student tested copper sulfate solution and calcium iodide solution using flame test. The method used. Deep a metal wire in a copper sulfate solution. Put the metal wire in a blue Bunsen burner flame. Record the flame color produced. Repeat steps 1 to 3 using the metal wire but using calcium iodide solution. What flame color is produced by copper sulfate solution? So copper has copper 2 plus ion and copper 2 plus ion produces green flame color. Calcium compounds produce an orange red flame color. The student left out an important steps before reusing the metal wire. The student's method did not produce a distinctive orange red flame color using the calcium iodide solution. So, mainly the student did not clean the metal wire between the test. And as a result, copper sulfate solution was still present in that metal wire. So, the color that the student produced was mixed and it was blended and masked. The student added sodium hydroxide solution to copper sulfate solution. Calcium iodide solution give the results of the test. When sodium hydroxide is added to copper sulfate solution, a blue precipitate is formed. And when sodium hydroxide is added to a calcium iodide solution, we will see a white precipitate. To test for sulfate ions, the student added dilute hydrochloric acid to copper sulfate solution. Name the solution that would show the presence of sulfate ions when added to this mixture. To test for sulfate ions, we have to add barium chloride solution. Along with it, we can add hydrochloric acid. Since the hydrochloric acid is already added, so we'll have to add barium chloride solution. To test for iodide, the student added dilute nitric acid to the calcium iodide solution. Name the solution that would show the presence of iodide ions when added to this mixture. Give the results of the test. So, if we want to test for iodide ions, we have to add dilute nitric acid. Followed by that, we'll have to add silver nitrate solution. And a yellow precipitate will form because of silver iodide. This question is about water. In UK, potable drinking water is produced from different sources of fresh water. Explain how potable water is produced from fresh water. At first, an appropriate source of fresh water is chosen. For example, rivers, streams, lakes, or a borehole. And then, once the water is taken out from the source, it is passed through filter beds, which removes undissolved solids that are within the water. And then, the water is sterilized using chlorine or ozone or ultraviolet light, which is used to destroy the harmful micro microbes in the water. A different country has very little rainfall. A long coastline, plentiful energy supplies. Suggest one process this country could use to obtain most of this potable water. So the country can use distillation process or reverse osmosis since they do not have any shortage of energy supplies. Wastewater is not fit to drink. Treatment of wastewater produces two substances, liquid effluent, solid sewage sludge. Now we have to draw one line from each substance to the way the substance is process processed. So in the, in, in the case of liquid effluent, liquid effluent is treated by aerobic biological treatment. The microbiomes, the microbes basically, you know, eat all the effluent material. And the solid sewage sludge is processed by anaerobic digestion, which produces methane and turns the solid sewage into mud. Table 1 shows information about the disposal of processed solid sewage sludge in the UK in 1992 and in 2010. Mass of processed solid sewage sludge in millions of kilograms. Year 1992, used as fertilizers, 440. Sent to landfill, 130. So the total is 998 in 1992 and 2010 it is 14, 14, 13. Calculate the percentage of processed solid sewage sludge that was burned in 2010. So in 2010, 260 million kilograms was burned and 1413 was processed. So it's going to be 260 divided by 1413 into 100. The answer is 18.4%. The question says we have to answer in three significant figures. Suggest one reason why the total mass of processed solid sewage sludge increased between 1992 and 2010. From 1992 to 2010, the population has increased substantially and they produce more wastewater than before, which is and less untreated sewage is discharged back into the environment. Between 1992 and 2010, the proportion of processed solid sewage with sludge used as fertilizer increased. So, there's two reasons why. Mainly, all right, 
From 1992 to 2010, the population has increased, thereby there was an increase in demand for food. So to conserve energy, all right, this solid uh, sewage sludge, they were used as fertilizers. And, you know, since the landfill spaces are running out, all right, we can also uh, process the solid sewage sludge as fertilizer, which is a better option. Or we can say there is an increased demand for organic fertilizer, which can be met by processed solid sewage sludge. This question is about hydrocarbons. Hexane and hexene are hydrocarbons containing six carbon atoms in each molecule. Hexane is an alkane and hexene is an alkene. Draw one line from each hydrocarbon to the formula of that hydrocarbon. So hexane. Hexane is an alkene, has a general formula of CnH2n plus 2. So since it is C6, then it's going to be H14. Hexate has a general formula of CnH2n. So since it is CnH2n, if it is C6, then it's going to be H12. Bromine water is added to hexane and to hexene. What would be observed when bromine water is added to hexane and to hexene? Bromine water does not react with hexane, so it will remain orange. However, bromine water reacts with hexene, so it will become colorless. Ethane is an alkane and ethene is an alkene. Figure 1 shows the displayed structure or formula of ethane and ethene. CC single bond between ethane and CC double bond between ethene. Compare the ethane and ethene. We should refer to the structure and bonding and their reactions. So, first of all, we need to say both of them are hydrocarbons and both of them contains two carbon atoms per molecule. Ethane contains six hydrogen atoms per molecule, whereas ethene contains four hydrogen atoms per molecule. Both of them have covalent bonds. Ethane contains CC single bond, whereas ethene consists of CC double bond. Both of them also contain CH bonds. So in this regard, they're similar and both of them are smaller molecules. In terms of reaction, both of them reacts with oxygen in complete combustion reaction to produce water and CO2 and in incomplete combustion reaction to produce water carbon monoxide, and sometimes carbon. Incomplete combustion is more likely to happen with ethene. Ethene decolorizes bromine water, and ethene does not decolorize bromine water because ethene has CC double bond. It makes it more reactive, and ethene can, re ethene can react with hydrogen to produce ethane. It can react with steam or water to produce ethanol. It can react with halogen to produce halogen alkane. Ethene can undergo addition reactions. Ethene can polymerize to produce polyethene. So these are additional properties of ethene. This question is about ink. A student investigated green, green ink using paper chromatography in a beaker. A student used water as a solvent. Figure 2 shows the chromatogram obtained. You can see the solvent front, yellow dye, blue dye, and the start line. RF value for the yellow dye is 0 0.6. The distance moved by the yellow dye is 5.5. 7. Calculate the distance moved by the solvent. We know that RF is equals to distance moved by a particular dye divided by the distance moved by the solvent. So to calculate that, since we know the RF value which is 0 0.6, so we're going to write 0 0.6 is equals to 5.7, which is the distance moved by the yellow dye divided by the distance moved by the solvent. Then we are going to make the distance moved by the solvent as subject and write 5.7 divided by 0 0.6, which gives us 9.5 centimeter. The green ink contains more than two compounds. Suggest one reason why only two spots are seen in figure two. We can only see two spots. It could be due to two reasons. First of all, some of the compounds are colorless in the solution, so they did not appear in the as a spot. Or the compound, two of the compounds have the same RF value, so they appeared as the single spot. On the student's chromatogram, the yellow and the blue spots are very close together. Which two ways could increase the distance between the spots? If we allow the solvent to travel even further than the original one, then we will get, you know, more gap between the spots. And the other point could be we can use a different solvent in which they are going to have different solubility. Drying the chromatogram or using a larger beaker or using a larger spot of green ink does not have any effect. The manufacturers of the green ink always use the same proportion of yellow dye and blue dye. Suggest one reason why. The manufacturer always use the same proportion so that, so that they produce the same shade of green every time. The RF value of the dye depends on the solubility of the dye in the solvent. 
the attraction of the dye to the vapor, which will definitely produce a smaller order value if the solvent and paper are both changed. The dye is less soluble in the new solvent and less attracted to the new paper. If we want to make a smaller order value, it means the dye must travel only a little amount of distance. If it is less soluble, then it is going to travel less distance, but if it is less attracted to the paper, then it will travel more distance. The dye is less soluble in the new solvent and more attractive to the new paper. This could be the correct option because if it is less soluble, in the solvent then it will not want to dissolve in the solvent and travel upwards whereas it is more attracted to the new paper means it's gonna be more attracted to the paper and want to stick with the paper and will not want to travel upwards this question is about materials used to make food plates food plates are made from paper polymers or ceramics we can see paper, polymers, and ceramics. Number of packaged in 10 DM cube card box. Paper, we can put a lot. Polymer, we can only put 10. Ceramics, we can only put only 50 in a box. Average number of times that can be used is 1. In terms of polymer, they can be used up until 400. And ceramic plates can be used 1000 times. The biodegradability for paper, it is biodegradable. Ceramic, no. Polymers, no. Recyclability for paper, yes, we can recycle it. Polymer, we can recycle it. But ceramic, we cannot recycle it. So just two pieces of information about the energy usage which would help to produce a complete life cycle assessment for the three foot plate material so we can actually you know take the energy that is used in the extraction of the raw material or the processing of the raw material or you know the manufacturing of the plates or the transportation of the plates or cleaning the non-disposable plates or if recycling is possible then recycling of that particular plates Evaluate the use of three materials for making food plates. You should use features of life cycle assessments. For the raw materials, trees are renewable. Crude oil and clay are finite resources. And in terms of manufacturing and packaging, paper plates use the least packaging so conserves raw material. Paper plates need less transportation overall as more plates can be placed in a 10 dm cube cardboard box. All right. In terms of use and operation, paper plates are single use so must be replaced as often all right most often ceramic plates last longer than polymer plates so must be replaced less often however in terms of disposal ceramic plates takes up the landfill which is we are running out of landfills obviously and then in terms of you know paper and polymer plates they can be used to make more products because we can recycle them however one thing to be noted recycling conserves raw material if recycling is possible describe how ceramic foot plates are produced from clay. Wet clay is first taken and then it is shaped in the shape of the plate. And then it is dried and then it is heated in a furnace. It is fired in a furnace until it turns into the solid, you know, ceramic plate that we know. Guys, that's all for today's video. Thank you for watching. See you in the next video, guys. Bye-bye.